Good morning, will you please stand and sing with us? Those who trust in the Lord Those who trust in the Lord Of a strong mountain They will not they will not be moved those who trust those who trust in the Lord on a strong mountain they will not be moved they will not be moved though the world moves like mad though the world moves like mad you O Lord are faithful You, you will not, you will not be changed. Those who trust in the Lord are his Mount Zion. They will not, they will not be moved. Those who trust in the Lord. Of his mouth, Zion, they will not, they will not be moved. Though the world, though the world moves like mad, you, O oh Lord, are faithful. Jesus, you, you will not, you will not be changed. Though the world moves like mad you oh lord are faithful jesus you you will not you will not be changed christ the king christ the king sets my feet on a firm foundation that will not that will not be moved Christ the King sets my feet on a firm foundation that will not, that will not be moved. Though the world moves like man, you, O oh Lord, are faithful. Jesus, you, you will not. You will not be changed, though the world, though the world moves like mad, you, O oh Lord, are faithful. Jesus, you, you will not, you will not be changed. everybody. It's so good to see you this morning. My name is Heath. Welcome to this time of worship. Uh, before you sit down, take a moment and just greet your brother and sister Christ next to you. Good morning, Karen. Good to see you. And if you could make it. <laughs> All right, as, as you're taking a seat, there's just a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, our next Membership Matters class is April 15th, uh, and that's a chance for those who are exploring membership here at PHUMC to find out what that's all about. So April 15th, uh, immediately following worship until 2 o'clock. Uh, also on the back of the, the handout you got um, is our Easter Sunday morning schedule. Easter's going to be here before we know it, and so we'll have special times for worship on, on Easter morning. So I encourage you to take note of that. Well, as we, uh, as we enter into this time of worship together, let's center our hearts and minds with a word of prayer. Oh God, we are here this morning because we are hungry and we are thirsty for good news. Our lives are surrounded in so many ways uh, by bad news. Um, and so many of us come here today uh, perhaps with a feeling of being burdened down and loaded down. Uh, and Lord, we pray that during this time of worship that your spirit of peace would descend upon us 
We pray that you would speak the fresh words of hope into our lives that, that we really need to hear. We pray that you would open our minds to your spirit of truth uh, and lead us where you want to take us today as we explore your scriptures together. So God, we dedicate this time to you. We pray that you would help us to set aside distractions, worries, concerns, and anxieties. Help us to breathe deeply and to be fully present to you and to the work of your spirit among us. We ask these things in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I danced down from heaven and I danced on earth. Bethlehem, I had my birth. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. For the scribe and the Pharisee They would not dance and they would not follow me I danced for the fishermen, for James and John They came with me and the dance went on Dance, dance, wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he Danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lame The holy people said it was a shame They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high They left me on the cross to die Dance, dance, wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he Danced on a Friday when the sky turned black It's hard to dance with the devil on your back They buried my body and they thought I'd gone But I and the dance still go on Dance, dance, wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he Cut me down, I left on high I am the light that will never ever die But I'll live on you if you live in me I am the Lord of the dance, said he Dance, dance, wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he I grew up in the Methodist church, and I grew up in a, a church environment where we sang hymns every Sunday. And I remember as a kid, that's the only song I really liked, because it was the only hymn that sounded remotely happy. It had this happy feeling to it. So I've, I've always loved that hymn. Uh, today we're continuing on our sermon series, Talk the Walk. And before I get into that, let me just point out this to you again. If uh, the sermon today raises any sort of questions for you that you'd like to ask me, you can text them to this number. Uh, and then later this week, I'll do a video response on my blog and the address for that is there on the screen. It's also on your handout as well. So I'd encourage any questions uh, that you may have from that. Well, we're continuing on this sermon series, Talk the Walk, where we are looking at kind of several key phrases in the Christian vocabulary. And we started off looking at God's Word, then we looked at salvation, and then last week Jay and Katie did a great job exploring some of the nuances of the phrase born again. And today we get to the word evangelical. Uh, and I've been really looking forward to this uh, sermon for several reasons. This is the word, out of all these, I think this is the one word that's probably the most contentious, 
uh, divisive, contested word uh, out of all of them. Uh, it's probably the word that has become the most, uh, maybe distorted is too strong of a word, but very truncated in its meaning uh, in contemporary culture today. Um, one of the main reasons why is because this word has become extremely politicized. And because it's become politicized, it's therefore become very uh, polarized. When most people use the word evangelical today, especially um, within churches, but also outside of the church and, and news media and things like that, it's almost always synonymous with Republican. Uh, we're in election year. You may have noticed that. And on cable news shows, one of the things they're talking about now is, you know, what's it going to take for the candidate to get the evangelical vote? And evangelical is often considered just a subset of voters among the Republican Party. Now, let me be very clear where I'm going with this so I can just put you at ease. And I really don't want to be misunderstood on this point. I am not saying that you can't be evangelical and Republican. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am strongly saying is that you don't have to be a Republican to have evangelical faith. Those two are very intertwined in common usage, but in fact, evangelical faith and conservative politics can be very, very different things. And historically, they have been different things at different times. Um, just to drive home this point, uh, let me share with you a, a couple of stats from a recent book I read called Hijacked. It's written by a Methodist pastor named Mike Slaughter. And by the way, I would encourage uh, anyone to read this book as an individual, but if you have a Sunday school class and you're thinking about what you might want to study, this would be a great book to study together. It's an examination of how kind of politics have infiltrated the church and affected the way we think about a lot of things and do a lot of things. Well, one of the things that Mike Slaughter points out, and there's this historical chapter, and he points this out, that in the 1960s, about 70% of people who self-identified as evangelical voted Democrat. Now, as someone who was just born in the late 70s without this historical awareness, this was very, very surprising to me. He pointed this out, that in the last two elections, about 70% of people who self-identified as evangelical voted Republican. Isn't that fascinating? He talks about how in the, in the early 80s, essentially, when there was this big demographic shift among evangelicalism uh, with the... Um, with the election of President Reagan and the rise of Jerry Falwell and the moral majority and things like that. Now, please don't take any of this as an evaluation. This is just a very straightforward, descriptive statement that in terms of historical fact, evangelical faith, evangelical identity, and Republican politics have not always been intertwined. So that's the first thing I want to sort of get out there today is that when we're talking about being evangelical, uh, we're not necessarily talking about how you vote. Now, I think that what has happened with the term evangelical is really kind of a symptom of a larger issue we have in our culture in the relationship between religion and politics. Uh, I think that in many ways our partisan political system has really shaped and formed the way we have discussions as Christians about theological issues uh, and about moral issues and ethical issues. Uh, you might put it like this, that red and blue politics has led to very black and white thinking in lots of sectors of society, I think religion included. Um, we're encouraged to think about things in very polar opposite ways, red and blue, black and white. One of the things that's very dominant in our culture is this idea that for every moral or ethical uh, or religious issue, there are two polar opposite responses to it, and those are the only responses to it. Now, of course, that's not the way things really are. Uh, reality is a whole lot more complex than two very neatly defined opposite responses that we often give the labels of liberal and conservative. I think one of the most unfortunate things about that way of seeing reality is that it oversimplifies things drastically. And so oftentimes someone's uh, theological views might be pigeonholed as, well, that's liberal or that's conservative. And it's dismissed then just with name calling rather than really carefully considering the arguments. And so in many ways, I think our political culture has contributed to a very sort of divisive spirit uh, among us Christians. And to be honest, we didn't really need the help in the first place. We're already pretty good at being divisive uh, on our own. But the kind of culture we live in and the media culture encourages us to have these two uh, very opposite responses to everything and then just to fight about it. And of course, our media shapes the way we think about this in a lot of ways. When is the last time you turned on a cable news channel, doesn't matter which one it is, and saw two people sitting by each other where one person explained their view, and then the other person said, I never thought of it that way before. That's a good point. 
but let me challenge you on this and that. And then the other person says, well, that's a good point too, but let me... No, you don't ever hear reasoned dialogue between two adults who assume they don't know the whole truth and nothing but the truth about everything. What you often see are people who are certain and absolute and very quick to demonize and characterize the other side. And I think that whole political media mentality has very much infiltrated the church. In fact, that's what Slaughter's main thesis is in this book, is that we as Christians have to be so careful that our discussions with one another don't mirror the way discussions often happen in the world around us. John Wesley, the founder of this whole United Methodist deal, uh, often preached that, that followers of Christ should have what he called a Catholic spirit. And by that he meant a universal spirit. The meaning of Catholic originally meant just universal. And so for John Wesley, he wanted Methodist Christians not to be known for their stance on controversial issues. He wanted Methodists to be known for the love that they show one another across the, the divides of disagreement. Uh, whenever we have a new membership class, uh, I often teach, uh, or every time I teach a short little section on the history and the theology of the United Methodist Church. And one of the things I point out every time to folks is that as United Methodists, our, our spiritual unity does not come from uniformity of thought. Now, lots of denominations are premised on that. That is, if you're going to be a part of this group, you look this way, you talk this way, you think this way, you vote this way. But in the United Methodist Church, our unity is not found in uniformity of thought about everything. Our unity is found in our common commitment to walk in the way of Jesus Christ, which is the way of love. So as Christians, I think we have to be so careful that we don't let this divisive spirit infiltrate us. Now, it's fine to disagree about things, and Methodists are known for disagreeing about things. We have a very wide and broad tent, but disagreement and divisiveness are two very, very different things. And I think one of the ways we can be salt and light in our culture is not by being known for what stances we take. And, and I'm not saying stances and positions aren't important. I'm just saying the way that we can stand out in our culture is the kind of love and respect we show those who disagree with us. We're not going to stand out for the stances we take, but we can stand out for how we choose to have dialogue and disagreement with one another. Here's the last thing I want to say on this point, and then we'll move on. As Christians, we should refuse to let our religious vocabulary and our theological discussions be forced into a predetermined political framework. You know, as a Christian pastor, you need to know, I have absolutely zero interest, in fact, probably negative interest, in getting people into the kingdom of the Republicans or in getting people into the kingdom of the Democrats. My interest and my calling and my vocation, of course, lies in drawing people into the kingdom of God and letting them know it's a kingdom of love. And for all of us who identify as Christian, we have to know that we are Christian first Republican second, or Christian first and Democrat second, or Christian first and independent, or whatever your political party is. If your sense of identity and value, if your sense of priorities comes more from a political party than it does from the fact that you're a member in Christ's holy church, then you've got a problem. Because Christ didn't come to be a mascot for anybody's political party. He came to be Lord over all things, and politics included. And so as Christians, that's our primary identity. That's where we get our source of values and our sense of worth, not from a political affiliation. So being evangelical, this was all by, by way of introduction, by the way. This isn't what I want to talk about today. But being evangelical is not about do you vote for this person or that person. Being evangelical is about are you centered on one person named Jesus of Nazareth? I want to look into the uh, kind of the origins of the word evangelical. I think it can be very helpful and descriptive for thinking about it. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, and the first part of that word, uh, eu, means good. Think of eulogy, good words about someone. Um, and then the word angel, uh, which means a messenger or a message. And so just uh, in terms of the origin of the word, it literally means a good message or good news, or as it was translated in older English, just gospel. So this is all the same word. Euangelion, good news, gospel, it's all the same word. Now, interestingly enough, in the first century, this word, euangelion, originally came from a, a military and political context. This wasn't a word that Christians made up, and it wasn't a word that had unique religious meaning. Instead, it began its life as a political term in the first century Roman Empire. Let me share with you a quote from a document from the, um, this is from 9 B.C., so nine years before the birth of Christ, and it's uh, uh, in praise of Caesar Augustus. 
And it says this, Whereas the providence which has guided our whole existence and which has shown us such care and liberality has brought our life to the peak of perfection and giving to us Augustus Caesar, and who being sent to us and to our descendants as a savior, has put an end to war and set all things in order. And whereas the birthday of the God, referring to Caesar Augustus, has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel, euangelion, concerning him, therefore let all reckon a new era beginning from the date of his birth. Interestingly enough, Jesus was born into a world where there was already a person who was heralded as a savior, who is said to bring a gospel, and whose birth split the calendar in two. Euangelion was a word that was used in Roman um, political propaganda. It was used any time an emperor came to the throne or that emperor won a military victory that would bring uh, at least perceived peace for the empire. That was heralded as good news, euangelion. And so this isn't just any old good news. This was like world-changing announcement. Anytime a new emperor took the throne, anytime there was a decisive military victory, messengers would be sent out throughout the Roman Empire to announce this good news of what this king has done. And so when Jesus and his followers take this word gospel, euangelion, it's already a word that's loaded with significance. And Jesus and his earliest followers were bold enough to say that this message that we have is just as big news as what Caesar Augustus has to say. It is just as world-changing as what he has to bring. This is how Mark sums up the preaching of Jesus, as repent and believe the gospel. The word repent there is metanoia. It literally means to go beyond. Meta means beyond, and noia means mind. Repent doesn't necessarily mean feel bad about something you've done. To repent means to see things differently, to go beyond the mind that you currently have, to think about things in a different way. And so Jesus says, repent, change your way of thinking, and accept the good news that I have to bring you, the good news about God and what God asks of us. Jesus came to bring this world-changing announcement. Jesus described his mission and message in terms of something that, when it's accepted, would literally begin to change the world. I want us to look at one specific place in the Gospels where Jesus really clearly defines what his evangel, what his good news is all about. Because being evangelical at the end of the day is about being centered on Jesus' good news. That's what the word literally means, to be gospel-centered. And so we're going to look at one place in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth and he preaches there for the first time. Now, there are several passages in the Gospels that Christians have for a long time acknowledged as being especially important. Now, of course, every passage in the Gospels is important, but there are some passages, think, for example, of like the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. Christians have long acknowledged that that is one of the, the clearest ways of seeing what Jesus was about. Also, Luke 4 is one of those passages because Jesus gives this sermon, this speech, where he kind of introduces people to what his whole ministry is going to be about. So we're going to take a moment to look uh, at this passage carefully together in Luke chapter 4. It says, When he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now let's talk for a moment about the various things that Jesus says that his good news will bring. He starts off by saying that his good news is good news to the poor. Now what we're going to see with each of these things is that I think Jesus intends both very literal and deeper spiritual meanings to these. If you were to read what biblical scholars have to say about this passage, some of them say he's uh, purely talking about just, you know, literal poverty, for example. And then some scholars will say, no, he's not talking about literal poverty, being poor. He's talking about spiritual poverty. 
But I take a more middle-of-the-road position. I, I think Jesus was a very brilliant teacher, and I think he probably intended more than one meaning in what he's saying here. So there's a sense in which there's very literal reference to what he's saying. Jesus' good news would be good news to the poor, that is literally those who find themselves without enough. Because Jesus' good news is news that would inspire people to become a community of generosity. That's what we see happening in the early churches, that they are so overwhelmed and grateful for the grace they've received from God that they're willing to sell some of the things they have so that they can help other people out. Um, so this is literally good news for the poor, what Jesus is doing. In the same way, uh, the early Christians worked to release captives, that is, those who were slaves. They would often, uh, for example, Christians were known for fasting uh, and saving the money from the food uh, that they would have bought, and then they would save that up, and then they would set people free from slavery by, by buying them, by redeeming them. Uh, and that's the word we're going to be talking about next week. Redeeming originally was about setting a slave free. Um, Jesus and his first followers uh, and his followers still today were known for actual physical healing. Jesus literally healed blind people, and many of his followers have and still do. But many of these, these ideas here, these ideas of poverty, uh, these ideas of blindness and captivity, were also very much spiritual metaphors uh, for first century Jews like Jesus. These, these ideas encapsulated what it meant to be a human being, that in many ways we're spiritually blind, we're spiritually poor, we're in need of liberation and release uh, and ransom. In fact, the word that says release to the captives, that's the same word that often gets translated as forgiveness in the New Testament. It's the very same word. So there's ideas of being set free here. Um, this last one is probably the, the, the least intuitive to understand, this idea of the year of the Lord's favor. And the biblical background for that goes back to Leviticus 25 and what's called the year of the Jubilee. Now, this is utterly fascinating. In ancient Israel, one of the laws that they had, as it's spelled out in Leviticus 25, is what was called the year of the Jubilee, where every 50 years, all debts would be canceled. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be chaotic, though? How does that work? But every 50 years, debts were to be canceled, and wealth was to be redistributed back to who it originally belonged to. This was a way of, of helping the gap between the rich and the poor not get so wide. And so this, this idea of the Jubilee was a powerful one. Now, there's little to no evidence that the ancient Israelites actually carried this out. I mean, it would be extremely hard in practice to do. But nevertheless, it set forth as an ideal, this, this ideal of every 50 years the debts are canceled, and that 50th year was known as the year of the Lord's favor. Now, what happened over time is, is that many ancient Jews began seeing this economic reality as signifying a deeper spiritual reality. And so they started talking about the year of the Jubilee as the time in which God would cancel all the debts of sin. And so in Jesus' day, this was a very loaded phrase. And when Jesus says, this is being fulfilled in your hearing, what he is saying is that in his coming, he's bringing the Jubilee year. He is announcing that God is, is setting people free from the debts of sin that they owe to him. And so this was... This is what Jesus' message is about. It's about salvation, it's about liberation, it's about healing, it's about transformation. Now, what's fascinating in this story is the response that he gets from the hometown folk. Notice in verse 20, the response they give him initially. It says, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And the word translated fixed there literally means to stretch very wide. So their eyes were open really, really big. Whatever Jesus has said and done here it's causing everyone to really take notice, and their eyes are open wide. Now, what has he said that has caused them to open their eyes so wide? No doubt part of it is the fact that he says this scripture is being fulfilled in their hearing today, but I think there's more to it than that. What's most fascinating about this story and most instructive for its true meaning is not so much what Jesus says, but what he doesn't say. Now, he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, when he reads from the scroll. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And in this original context in Isaiah, the vengeance was directed towards the Gentiles, towards the outsiders. And the common understanding of that time, of first century Jews and even before, their understanding was is that when the servant of the Lord comes, when the Messiah comes, it will be to bring blessing and salvation to Israel, but it will also be to bring damnation and curses to those who are on the outside. 
And so they envisioned the coming of this servant of the Lord as not only about blessing for them, but about damnation for others. The day of vengeance of our God. Jesus doesn't say this last part of verse 2. Jesus cuts off the reading after saying to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It says he then rolled up the scroll and sat down, and at that point, everybody's eyes were fixed on him. Now, their eyes were fixed on him because they knew what this passage said. This is one of those passages that every good first century Jew would have had memorized by heart. It was foundational for their thinking. They would have known that he left out this crucial part. Uh, let me just do this little experiment with you. By the way, this part's going to be interactive, so I, I need your participation. Let me read you a couple things that you're probably used to, and you tell me what phrase is missing. In the name of God, I take you to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. What would I leave out? For richer, for poorer. Very good. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under God, yeah, we, re we recognize that immediately, right? Now, when Jesus is preaching from Isaiah, when he leaves out that phrase, everyone would have had that same immediate reaction you just had. They would be thinking to themselves, wait a minute, he just left out one of the most important parts of that. It was no accident that Jesus left this part out, because in Jesus' understanding of his mission, he did not come to bring damnation for the enemies of God. He came to bring salvation. He did not come to bring retribution. He came to bring restoration. This completely defines the way Jesus would approach his ministry, and especially the way he would approach those who were deemed to be outsiders. Now, just to show you just how not incidental and not accidental this is, let's go on to look at the rest of this story, and you'll see how Jesus drives home this point. The story goes on like this. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. Now, these two verses here are the most difficult to interpret in this story because a, a real shift happens here. Apparently, at the start, they were content to just let things go at a polite surface level. The good sermon, good sermon. Even though they disagreed with what Jesus was saying, they all were speaking well of him. Everything was going okay. But Jesus is not content to leave well enough alone. He begins to press them a little more. I think it's because Jesus can discern among this audience that they're not fully with him, that they see him as just about coming for them and not the outsiders as well. And so he, verse 23 says, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And that's kind of confusing for us to understand, but apparently what the scholars say is that in the ancient world, that proverb was used to describe how people should take care of their own first. So in other words, a doctor's family should be the first to be, to be healthy. And so that proverb has connotations of being inward focused, of taking care of your own. And so Jesus seems to discern among these people that they only want him for bringing blessings to them and not them as well. That they see him as just being sort of a, an insider savior, but not someone who is coming for all people. And so Jesus presses them on this, and then he begins to preach a little more. He said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown, but the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath, in Sidon. Sidon, by the way, was a place in ancient Canaan that was known especially for the worship of the god Baal. And the worship of the god Baal was, it was a cult in ancient Canaan that was known for child sacrifice, many other sorts of dark things. So when people thought of Sidon, they thought of just pure evil, darkness, all that sort of stuff. And yet he points out here that there was a time when people were in need in Israel, God's chosen people, and yet God takes an Israelite prophet and sends him to Sidon in order to help out a widow there. He goes on to say there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. He was a prophet immediately following Elijah. None of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now this is highly significant because at that time in Israel's history, Syria was their arch enemy. And yet the Lord takes a prophet from Israel and blesses the military commander of the nation's enemy. He heals 
Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They're filled with rage because do you see what Jesus is doing? He is selectively quoting from Old Testament history to show that God has a pattern of caring about those that the Israelites were willing just to consign to hell. That God has a pattern of caring and loving for people that they would have been more than happy to just define outside the bounds of God's love. And so they get infuriated with Jesus because he has the audacity to move the boundaries of God's love where they have so firmly placed them. And they not only just get a little mad, they get really mad. It says they got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. And these are his hometown folks. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. They tried to kill him. Because he moved those boundaries they had so firmly put in place. Now, they didn't succeed in this case. But ultimately, this is why Jesus would be killed. Jesus would be killed by the religious and political authorities of his day because he moved boundaries that those religious and political authorities depended on for their identity and for their job. Jesus moved boundaries in a way that no one before him had. Jesus is good news. Jesus' evangel is centered on an all-inclusive divine love that makes room for even those who are considered our enemies. This is what it means to be evangelical. It means to be centered and rooted in this good news, in this world-changing announcement that God is even for those that we would deem to be our enemy. Now, friends, if we're honest with ourselves, and we should be, we're in church after all, this message is just as challenging to us as it was to first-century Jews. You might be even getting a little mad at me for saying some of these things. Hopefully you won't try to take me and throw me off, you know, Pinnacle Mountain or something. But it is challenging to hear this. When we think about our national enemies, we think about our personal enemies. And yet Jesus is saying this world-changing announcement, this good news that God loves even them, even cares for them. It's very ironic, I think, that in today's religious culture, today's political culture, the word evangelical is often associated with people who are known for restricting and narrowing the scope of God's love. The word evangelical is often has connotations of harshness or judgmentalism. But to be truly and deeply and authentically evangelical is about not restricting those, but expanding those boundaries of God's concern and love to include the whole human family. You see, to be evangelical, I think, it's not about who you vote for. And it's not even really about do you subscribe to this specific set of religious doctrines? To be evangelical is to accept and live by Jesus' good news that God's love overflows for all people. According to Jesus, being evangelical is about being centered and grounded in a divine love that's so wide and so big that it causes the boundaries within the human family to just melt away. And so in that sense, I hope all of us here, and I hope that we as a church, can be deeply, deeply evangelical. I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, we are challenged by this good news, by this evangel that your son Jesus came to bring us. Because it truly is a world-changing announcement. And it forces us to repent, it forces us to think about things in different ways. Because Lord, we confess that we are so very quick to draw lines between those who are on the inside and those who are on the outside. We confess that we are very quick to use our religious beliefs, our political affiliations, to draw sharp boundaries between us and them. And we're very quick to demonize other people. And so, Lord, we come to you in a spirit of confession, and we just pray that you would help us to be honest with ourselves, and we confess all the ways in which we dismiss and write other people off. Uh, by oversimplifying things, by applying labels to them, uh, by choosing not to love them uh, because they don't vote the way we do or think the way we do or look the way we do. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us all to be deeply evangelical, that this good news of Jesus would take deep root in our hearts and our minds and that we might be the kind of people and the kind of church that's known for just loving, for just loving. The world is hungry for your good news, O God. We pray that you would help us to be messengers of that good news in all the ways that we can. 
in our families, in our church, in our workplace, wherever we're at, there are people who need this good news. There are people who think that they are outside the bounds of God's love and care because of what they've done or because of what was done to them. Lord, help us to be authentic messengers of your good news of extravagant love for all people. Lord, we pray that you would take our lives, that you would use them so that we might be your instruments of good news in this world that we live in. We ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer thine. Make my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Here am I, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee. Loving God, you have blessed each of us here today with faith, hope, and love. Jesus' mighty acts on the cross set us free from our despairs and self-centeredness and healed our brokenness. We know that we are loved, not only for who we are, but also for who we are becoming. 
You've not forgotten us and have made us members of Christ's holy church. You deal with us with mercy and grace and your favor, constantly reminding us that as the church, we are called to be the body of Christ for the world. Take these offerings. May they be used faithfully to proclaim to the world true freedom in Christ and the hope of the cross for all people. Give us strength and conviction to remove those boundaries that exclude. And now with confidence as the forgiven children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Such small sacrifice If not join with my life I sing in vain tonight May the words I say And the things I do Make my life so sing Bring a smile to you let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song. To reach a world in need To be your hands and feet May the words I say And the things I do Make my life so sing And bring a smile to you Let my life so Let my life so sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life so sing to you. Hallelujah. Though not my heart was true 
stand as you sing. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be it to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, Bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O oh God and your kingdom shall not pass away O oh ancient of days your kingdom shall reign your kingdom shall reign over all the earth, sing to the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth, sing to the ancient of days, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth, sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless wealth Sing to the ancient of days Every tongue, every tongue in heaven and earth Shall declare your glory Every knee shall bow at your throne In worship you will be exalted, O oh God And your kingdom shall not pass away Ancient of days, oh ancient of days, oh ancient of days. It's been so good to be together today. As you go, I invite you to go with this benediction. May the good news of Jesus Christ so fill your heart and life that you become good news for others. Go in peace. Amen.